Good morning. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ. Will you stand with me this morning as we prepare our hearts for worship? Baptist tradition, apparently. I'm not sure, uh, but I'm always so blessed by the words of that song because that's why we worship, that we would glorify God's name and that we would be blessed because we came, because we experienced God. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone, to St. Edward's Church. We are a church that desires to grow in holiness together. This morning, I have a brief reflection um, have you ever been so desperate for a spiritual breakthrough that you were willing to do just about anything in your life? I distinctly remember the very first time I ever fasted for three whole days. It was a couple of months that after the Lord saved me and my church was preparing up, uh, for a short-term mission trip to Nicaragua, I decided to fast because I've never done that before in my life. And I, I wanted to fast because I wanted to be used by God on this mission trip. And I was so desperate to experience God in Nicaragua. And let me just say, it was a bit of a gong show, my first time fasting. Uh, instead of praying and instead of being all holy, I was in my bed dreaming about all the food I would eat once I was done fasting. Uh, on, on day three, uh, you know, uh, we had a banquet for the mission team, the last hurrah, where we would have barbecue and yummy Korean food uh, for the whole mission team to be strengthened before they left for their mission trip. And I was upstairs in the couch area of someone's house, uh, dreaming about the doggy kibbles that was in the, in the corner of the room and looking at it and thinking, you know what, that's probably really good. <laughs> you know, it looked like chocolate cereal. I just think I remember those little brown balls thinking even that would be good right now. But here's the thing. Uh, God saw my, my struggle. Uh, he saw my motivation and he blessed it. And my spiritual hunger for grow, growing in faith was satisfied greatly during this mission trip. And I must say it was one of the most exciting, invigorating, powerful uh, 10 days of my life that I spent serving God in a different country. 
Jeremiah 29 verses 13 to 14 says this, and this is God's promise to us. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you. So as we worship today, may we seek him with all our heart and may God use us, cause us to desire him like nothing else. Our call to worship this morning comes from Psalm 63, which David wrote in the wilderness of Judah as he fled from his own son who wanted to kill him so he could become king. And there in the wilderness, he declared his hunger for God. It's a responsive call. O God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you. As in a dry and weary land where there is no water. So I have looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and glory. Because your steadfast love is better than life, my lips will praise you. So I will bless you as long as I live. In your name I will lift up my hands. We continue to worship this morning. Be 
Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. This song may be a new song for you, but I just want you to pay attention to the lyrics as it really embodies uh, today's theme about conquering God. So may it be our prayer and may it be our confession. Restores my life. 
Father God, we come to you this morning confessing the power of your Son's blood. By his blood we have been cleansed as white as snow, and he is our righteousness, he is our peace, he is our everything. And this morning we think about how much we hunger for you. This morning we reflect about what, to what extent you are our everything. Is it just lip service? Is this something that we feel on a given day, once in a blue moon? Or is this our daily confession before you, Lord? Lord, we come to you this morning and may your spirit bless us. May your spirit cause us to hunger, hunger for you, falling on our knees, crying out to you that I just want more of you, Jesus, that we just want to experience you in a whole new way, that we want a spiritual breakthrough that we would do anything for you if it meant that we could serve you and that we could please you and that we could grow in our righteousness, that we could grow in our faith and that we could progress into becoming more Christ-like. Stir it up in our hearts, Lord, a passion for your name. Stir up our hearts this morning, a hunger and a healthy appetite for your love, for your grace, for your peace for your mercy, for your gratitude. We come to you this morning and we, we long to glorify your name. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. I <clears throat> uh, would like you to stand with me. Uh, we will do the scripture reading together. As, we, as you know where we are, Matthew chapter 5, verses 2 to 6. It should all be on the screen for you. Oh, verses 3 to 6. It's the fourth beatitude today, and we'll read through the first four together. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. If I could ask for a volunteer this morning to pray as we open God's word together, I would appreciate that. Father, in the name of Jesus, the anointing and grace you can do nothing without you work in us through the Power of Jesus, Lord, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Father. Just an empty vessel, Father. Give me fill with the free spirit to be listening, bring out the pastor and the words. Open our eyes and our ears to your words. Help us to stand together, Father, to understand the whole Father God, which is more the gap that you may need in our midst, Father God. Thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. I'm going to begin by asking you some, some questions, and I, I do actually want this to be uh, somewhat interactive, but if, we'll, we'll see how it goes. So, have you ever fasted? Yes. Well, chances are yes. And when was the last time you fasted in your recent memory or distant memory, whichever? Two months ago. Two months ago, yeah. Anyone else? Long, long ago. <laughs> long, long ago. Okay. Sometimes eating healthy is sort of a fast. It's not really a fast. Yeah. So let's clear up something about fasting. There's a lot of different types of fasting that we see in the Bible. Uh, there are, there, fasting doesn't necessarily mean 
no eating and only drinking water, which is the traditional fast. Sometimes, they, uh, like Moses, if you are blessed by God, you fast with no water and no food for 40 days straight. Uh, but not only three people in the Bible have uh, fasted for 40 days, so not all of us should be attempting that uh, all at once. And then there's, Daniel, there's the Daniel fast where you only, you cut out certain foods that you consider a luxury. Uh, and now I think that what's more relevant than ever is media fasting. Uh, if you think about it, what's the point of cutting out food from your life if you just go on living your life of entertainment? Fasting is about coming closer to God. So absolutely, whatever helps you to cut away something with the motivation to go closer to God, that's what fasting is. So when was the last time you fasted? Well, for some of you, fairly recently, and for others, um, uh, a long, long ago. But if you could trace back to the last time you fasted, why did you fast? What was your motivation? I put up my fan in my kitchen last night. I didn't watch the game. I put this on. Okay. Sort of like a fast game, like hockey, but I thought that was more important. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, does it? Anyone else? Was it a So maybe, maybe fasting is something we could cover a little bit more in our fellowships uh, and, and maybe study a little more. And I think it is safe to say that it is a sort of a lost discipline within the church. Uh, and I do think it has immense spiritual benefits. Um, what I wanted to perhaps draw out was is, you know, if there was a story of someone who fasted, you know, what, what did you experience? You know, what was your motivation? And more often than not, it's because that you were hungering for something. It's, it's, it's kind of ironic. You're hungering for something that is spiritual. And so you give up the physical nourishment to sharpen all of your senses, to, to cut out all the distractions, to also sacrifice and to show to God that there is more to life than physical sustainment. He is our sustainer. That's what the confession of fasting is. It's your worship to God saying you are more important than anything else in this world. And part of that confession, uh, which includes mourning over certain uh, tragedies or certain big events in life, uh, is the discipline of fasting. I once met a pastor in Toronto who was part of my uh, a men's prayer group with my, with my dad. And one time he shared with me in a private, uh, you know, uh, I've tagged along with my dad and he shared with me the story of how he came to the Lord at a older age while he was a senior ranking army officer in the Korean army. I think he was like a one star general, if I don't, if I remember correctly. And if you are a general in South Korea, it's a huge deal. It's a big deal. You're, you are a big shot in the military. You know, you don't have to be four stars. One star is enough. But he had met the Lord in his, in his latter years of his military career. And now he felt like he was being called to ministry. He felt like he was being called to go to seminary school and become a pastor at an older age. And so torn by this decision where he would have had a very successful and illustrious military career and probably got more stars, he decided to fast to discern God's will. Instead, well, not instead, he decided to fast for 40 days to discern whether or not he should leave the military and become a pastor. And he did. But he told me how hard it was to work in the military at the same time as doing this fast because he couldn't tell anybody I need 40 days off because I'm going to be discerning whether or not I should leave the military. And he told me something that stuck in my mind. It's just, he said, I think it was on day 18 or 24, he was struggling. He said, Lord, I don't think I could go on any longer. You need to 
strengthen me, you need to feed me or else I'm going to die. Like this, I can't do this. That was just paraphrasing. And that evening in his dream, Jesus came to him and pulled out this root from the ground. And Koreans know what that was. It's, uh, Korean myth is all about finding this rare ginseng root that's a thousand years old that could cure anything, any sickness. And so many Korean dramas are based on people finding this root. And so Jesus pulled out this gigantic root that he was just astonished and he said, eat. And he bit into that root and it was so sweet. And as he ate it, his whole body began to be energized. He, he felt this flow of energy enter into his body. And then he woke up that morning after that dream, charged like he had eaten a full meal. And he went on for the remainder of the 40 days without any issues, running up and jogging up flights of stairs. And that was his testimony about how God blessed his hunger for him. Talk about spiritual hunger and a testimony of how God satisfies us. God designed our bodies to release all kinds of neurological signals to tell you, you got to get moving and find some food. It has been proven. It has been studied. It's an intricate machine and it, this complex body that God has given us. Hunger is essential and it works. It works. We're alive today because of our drive that God has given us to search food and nourish our bodies. But Jesus today, in today's fourth beatitude, does something where he combines the insatiable desire for food and our thirst for water, something physical that's something primal and instinctual, and he applies it to something spiritual. And the point is very clear to us. The desire for righteousness ought to be just as insatiable perpetual, instinctual, and essential for a believer. Hungering and thirsting are universal human experiences, but hungering and thirsting for the righteousness of God is to be a universal experience for a believer. That's what Jesus is saying. And the first four Beatitudes reveal to us a spiritual progression. They build on top of each other. The foundation is our realization that we are nothing before God and we are in need of His God and His grace and mercy. And each step presupposes the next, the one that has gone before, and they begin to build up on each other. And upon that knowledge, God-given knowledge of being poor in spirit, that we cannot merit God's grace, God gives us the realization of our sins and how we are to mourn and grieve it and repent of it and turn around from our sinful ways. And on top of that, we are to be meek, humble, and gentle towards others, knowing who we are before God, no better than the person next to us, just as sinful as the person next to us. Only we have received the grace and we share that grace with others. And then we arrive at hunger and thirst for righteousness. For what is the use of confessing and lamenting our sin, of acknowledging the truth about ourselves to God, if we leave it there? The progress of spirit, the, the progress of maturing in faith cannot stop at just mourning and repenting. Confession of sin must lead now then. To a change, a new hunger for future righteousness. That's all right. We're not missing missing very much. Do you hunger and thirst for God? That is the question we must ask ourselves this morning. Do you desire to become more Christ-like, more than anything else in this world? And what are you willing to do to get there? What are you willing to do to satisfy that hunger? And where are you going to go to satisfy that hunger? 
Let me read to you the quote that, uh, uh, this quote from Smith Wigglesworth. To hunger and thirst after righteousness is when nothing in the world can fascinate us as much as being near God. To hunger and thirst after righteousness is when nothing in the world can fascinate us so much as being near God. And when I told you that little story about the, that what, when, that time when I fasted, that, that, would, that was my experience. I couldn't care less that I was a week out from going to a foreign country and that fasting is probably not the best idea because you would need days to recover. I might be weak when I head into the mission field and blah, blah, blah. But I just knew within my heart, I wanted God more than anything else in this world. I wanted to experience God in Nicaragua more than anything else in, in this world. And I heard or I felt in my heart that fasting was what God had called me to do. And I did. And when we really love something or someone, nobody needs to ask about that someone or something. Our passion and our love for it is going to naturally just flow out of us. A friend or even a stranger need not ask to see photos of my children. I will find a way to pull them out casually and share it with them. You don't need to ask me about barbecuing. I will find ways to tell you about the new chicken marinade that I tried this week that I really want you to try and taste. But seriously, let's buy a barbecue, a church barbecue, put it right there outside in the parking lot and have a barbecue every Sunday after church. I've, I've daydreamed about grilling meat for my congregation long enough. Please make this a dream come true. <laughs> let's, let's make this a reality. <clears throat> But getting back to the script, the kingdom of God brings new spiritual appetites. Another dimension of human need is awakened within us by the Holy Spirit. And if we love God, if our heart is with God and He is our number one priority, nobody needs to ask us, are you a Christian? We will find a way to express that with our words and our actions. Because that is the hope of everything that we exist for. That is the hope of everything within us. He is our everything. And if we hunger and thirst for the righteousness of God, we will pursue that righteousness no matter what the cost in everyday living. And we will say no to compromises. And we will say no to temptations. And we will say no to all the things that people do. And we will say, but... It doesn't matter what that person is doing. It doesn't matter what so-and-so is doing. What matters is, what does God think of this? And that is often a conversation that my wife and I have to visit and say, really doesn't matter what other people are doing, is it? What does God think about this practice of ours? What does God think about this decision? Francis Chan once said this, and it really stuck with me. If the word of God said that Chinese people had to live on their heads, then I would try my absolute best to live upside down for the rest of my life. See, to Francis Chan, it wasn't about what is logical, how, how, to, how to make perfect sense of God's word. It was about his love for God. And he said it didn't matter if the Bible commanded that Chinese people are to live on their heads, then I will do my darndest. I will do my best to live on my head. Every born-again believer discovers this insatiable inner hunger that seeks God, that seeks to please God, because God's the one who gives it to us. It is precisely the work of God that births this new spiritual appetite within us. And there is perhaps no greater secret to progress in Christian living than cultivating, maintaining a healthy spiritual appetite for God. Let me tell you, you have to protect that hunger. You have to protect that spiritual appetite because this world is designed by the enemy to rob you of your spiritual appetite. 
Do you hunger and thirst for God? Or do we need to clear some cobwebs and dust off some memories of the last time we were hungry for the glory of God with everything that we had in our hearts? God will be found by those who seek Him with all their hearts because that's what God desires from us. He wants all of our hearts, not just the peace, not just what we can give, not just the crumb, not just what, we, what is left over at the end of the day. God wants all of us. If we're not hungry, what are we even doing here? Why do we even worship? Why do we gather? Who are we trying to fool by coming to church on Sundays? God sees through everything. And He wants people to come here hungry and ready to glorify Him and also to witness that glory in their life. He will be found by those who seek Him with all their heart. But here's the thing. Lacking righteous hunger is a real problem. It is a serious issue. And here's what Martin Lloyd-Jones says about the fourth beatitude. It's not on the slide. I do not know of a better test that anyone can apply to himself or herself in this whole matter of the Christian profession than a verse like this. If this verse is to you one of the most blessed statements of the whole scripture, you can be certain you are a Christian. If it is not, then you had better examine the foundations again. If the fourth beatitude does not speak to us in such a way that it is one of the greatest blessings in our lives, we ought to re-examine the foundations of our faith is what this quote challenges us to do. Lacking of godly appetite is a serious issue in the body of Christ. And here is what is ruining it. It's sin, it's pride, it's ego, it's self-pity, it's unforgiveness, it's lust, it's drunkenness, it's sexual immorality, it's jealousy, it's hatred, it's rivalry, it's division, and the like. And sin, like refined sugar, is sweet and easy to consume for the soul, and it is immediately gratifying. And indulging in sinful cravings will slowly change your spiritual taste buds. And the more you have it, the more you crave it. And the more you satisfy in it, the more you build a tolerance for it, and you end up needing more of it to feel just as good as the first time. And sin always begets more sin. Sin, my brothers and sisters, is what kills our godly appetite, our righteous hunger. Sin is what kills our godly appetite. And why do I say that? Because if we are examining ourselves truthfully before God today, and we are saying, where is my righteous hunger for God? Why am I not hungry and thirsty for God like my life depended on it? Why am I lacking in the fourth beatitude, this characteristic that is supposed to be in a believer? Why? If you're asking why, the answer is in our faces. It's sin. We've dulled our appetite for God with the things of this world. May we be challenged today to examine our spiritual appetite. Because if we satisfy ourselves, if we satisfy our soul's longings, our fleshly longings, we will suppress and dull our spiritual appetite for holiness. And the more we do that, the less we are inclined to think much of God. If we keep our mind flooded with dopamine through constant entertainment, if we constantly let in fear and uncertainty and doubt through our eyes and our ears, if we keep on pursuing selfish pleasures, we negate and wipe out 
the righteous hunger of God. And if we do not protect and guard our minds from what we watch and what we listen to, we will surely lose the battle against sinful appetites. And so to put it another way, if we look within ourselves, as I said earlier, and we can't find that hunger, we have to ask ourselves, what is suppressing my righteous hunger? What is robbing me of that righteous hunger for God? And what changes do I need to make in my life? What things do I need to cut out in my life? Do I need to maybe fast for a spiritual bondage to be broken? Do I need to be maybe more desperate about or more immediate about changing this aspect of my life? That is what I believe the message of the fourth beatitude is for this morning. My brothers and sisters, this is a serious disease in the body of Christ that we are being robbed all day long of our spiritual longing for our God. And we are being distracted to the point of starving our spiritual bodies. Some people just skip their breakfast, but some people just fly by the seat of their pants and eat whenever their busy and scattered mind thinks of eating. Some like to fast a solid five to six days a week. Some have been fasting far too long. And some are just plain dead. May the Spirit confront our sinful habit this morning of starving ourselves spiritually. May the Lord convict us of our state of spiritual health today. May we open our hearts' eyes and look in the mirror today, God's mirror, and examine what our spiritual body looks like. Is it healthy? Is it nourished? Is it being satisfied by God? May Christ awaken the hunger and thirst that is befitting of a believer. And this is the challenge for us from Jesus this morning. The truth of God acts like a mirror and opens our eyes to this spiritual reality. And we all have to stare into this mirror honestly before God. Even if we do not want to look inside and see what we look like before God, we have to. And if we are spiritually starving, if we look poor, if we look weak, vulnerable, malnourished, scrawny and lacking in muscles, then we better wake up after looking in that mirror and come to God to be satisfied and filled, to be nourished spiritually and say no to physical nourishment, say no to the things of this world so that we can reignite and awaken our hunger for God. When I end by saying, that Jesus offers us a solution today. It's not a complex solution. He declares a blessing over us. He declares a promise to us. His words instructs us to return to him. You can't hunger for God unless you if you have no need of him. There is no spiritual hunger without spiritual poverty. And there is no righteous hunger without a right relationship with God, with God and a repentance and a grievance and a, and a heart that mourns over sin. Spiritual hunger is a recognition of the spiritual lack within us. And it is a blessing and a gift from God who dwells within us. Jesus says in John chapter 6, 35, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. And whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. He's saying to us, come to me. Hunger and thirst after me. Come to me first thing in the morning. Come to me throughout your days. Think of me. Think of my words. Think of my principle. Think of my precepts. Re rely on the Spirit for your, all things. Be hungry. Be thirsty. Be excited for that next meal, pant 
for the Word of God, anticipated, abstain from dulling your spiritual hunger with cheap substitutions, stop drinking sweet sodas and drink from the living water, stop consuming junk with your eyes and with your ears and instead fill your mind with godly reflections. My brothers and sisters, we shall sat find satisfaction in Jesus Christ. Let us work up a healthy appetite for eternal life. May we thirst for living water together. Let's flee from sinful habits and ask God to instill new godly appetite. Let's worship God and experience and share this incredible blessing together. Blessed are those who abstain from taking satisfaction in sinful desires, for they shall be rewarded with an insatiable righteous hunger that the Lord will surely satisfy. Let us pray. There's a cry in my heart for your glory to fall, for your presence to fill up my senses. There's a yearning again, a thirst for discipline, a hunger for things that are deeper. Could you take me beyond? Could you carry me through? If I open my heart, could I go there with you? For I've been here before, but I know there's still more. Oh Lord, I need to know you. For what do I have if I don't have you, Jesus? What in this life could mean any more? You are my rock. You are my glory. You are the lifter of my head. When we are Christless, Lord, we are restless. What use is the wealth, honor, and pleasures of this world? All is nothingness without Christ. Show us our Lord and it will satisfy our souls. Let Christ clothe us, feed us, and intercede for us. Give us more of Christ or we die. Father, give us more of Christ or we die we die. And in your name we pray. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. With thankfulness we give in gratitude and joy. With prayerfulness we give in sacrifice and love. With hopefulness we give in commitment to God. Let us pray for this offering. Our Father in heaven, you have done great things for us and holy is your name. Bless all we offer to you, ourselves, our time and our possessions that through us your grace and favor may be known to all the world for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Redeemer. Amen. Please stand for the sending and benediction. <coughs> As you return to your place of daily worship, hear now God's invitation. Be mindful of all that robs you of your righteous appetite. Guard your mind from all sinful distractions. Avert your eyes and close your ears to unholy content. 
Fast and pray that God will bless you with righteous hunger. May the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely. And may your spirit and soul and body be kept sound and blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Glad you could join us for worship this morning. There's a few announcements.